Hello and thanks for listening. Welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your support. Starship will be the largest spaceship ever flown. Unlike the MERS Space Station, Skylab, or the ISS, Starship will need to make rapid maneuvers for orbital operations, refueling, and reentry. How will SpaceX control a 220-ton spacecraft once it reaches orbit? Spacecraft need not only a propulsion system, but also a reaction control system. A reaction control system makes sure the spacecraft is pointed in the right direction when it is firing its main engines or trying to dock with another ship or a space station. The ship must also change its orientation to shield itself from solar energy that could cause overheating. Overheating is a big problem in space. Without sufficient gas particles to allow convection and with no direct contact to allow conduction, radiation heating meaning the absorption of photons, is a big problem. Dark objects absorb photons, while white or shiny surfaces reflect them. To understand how Starship will deal with these problems, we must look closely at the only deep space vessel to carry humans out of low Earth orbit. The Apollo Command capsule was a shiny silver color. Even though the surface is very reflective, there is still a problem with the side facing the sun overheating while the side away from the sun might be too cold. This would cause thermal expansion of the metal on the hot side and contraction of metal on the cold side. This is a good formula to cause cracks to form in metal, and the Apollo Command capsule was slowly rotating to prevent this. The astronauts called this the rotisserie maneuver or the barbecue roll. The ship would be put into a slow spin along its long axis at a rate of about one revolution per minute that would allow uniform heating of the ship's hull. This is called passive thermal control. Apollo also had active thermal control. Here you can see the thermal control system in black. We will go into this schematic in depth in an upcoming lesson on life support. But here you can see the capsule water cooling systems with ethylene glycol, just like in your car's radiator, to cool the electronics, the astronauts' spacesuits, and the cabin itself. Coolant would be pumped through these systems, and heat would transfer to the liquid coolant. The coolant would then flow to these space radiators, where thermal radiation could carry the heat away into space. But what if the sun made the temperature of the radiators hotter than the interior of the ship? These valves would shut off water flow if the radiators were too hot. The ship was rolled to prevent this overheating. But how did they rotate the Apollo capsule so precisely? And how will SpaceX control something as large as Starship, just as precisely? The Starship is the size of a 16-story building, and has a mass with payload of over 220,000 kilograms even without fuel. Reaction control system thrusters on the exterior of the ship must be carefully controlled to maneuver safely. These cannot be dumb systems. Fully fueled, the Starship will have a mass of about 1,320,000 kilograms, or a little more than 2.9 million pounds. The thruster pulse that would barely move a fully loaded starship could throw an empty one into a deadly spin. The reaction control system on the starship will have to be very advanced. The starship will need powerful thrusters to control it when fully fueled, and much weaker thrusters to allow more delicate movements when it has less mass. Let's look at how this could be accomplished. Everyone watching the development of Starship closely noted these large thrusters being mounted on the side of the ship. Let me pause for a moment and acknowledge something. There are people working diligently around the clock to provide the invaluable service of documenting this incredible moment in human history as we build the first true spaceship capable of launching into space from the Earth or Mars with 100 tons of mass including up to 200 colonists and landing again. This is the dream that started to become possible with Tsiolkovsky and was kept alive by so many brilliant scientists, dedicating their lives to the advancement of humanity into space. Two of the most dedicated documentarians are the teams behind Boca Chica Gal and NASA Spaceflight. Without their dedication, we could not be a part of this amazing program. 
Here we see those thrusters. These are believed to be hot gas thrusters, which can mean several things. Cold gas thrusters are just a pressurized tank with a valve, an expansion chamber, and a nozzle. The gas is usually nitrogen, which will give a specific impulse of about 73 seconds. Not very efficient. If you move up to hydrogen gas, you can increase that to 272 seconds. The hydrogen is hard to store, and your thrusters must be immediately available to make a sudden correction and avoid disaster. A resisto jet heats the cold gas before use. This can make it a little less responsive. You must allow time for the resistor to heat up and transfer that heat to the gas, but it has a higher specific impulse. Microwave water thrusters could be a good option, but they are more complex than cold gas. Adding complexity increases the risk of failure. The Apollo capsules used two completely independent reaction control systems. These were the command module RCS, shown here, and the service module RCS, seen here. These could be used to control rotation in all three axes, as well as gently move the ship forward, backward, or to either side, to allow docking and other maneuvers. These reaction control systems could be operated manually or automatically. Here you see these RCS thrusters on the command module and on the service module. Let's look again at Starship and see how thrusters like these could move it around. Here you see a Starship outfitted with an RCS system similar to the one we saw before. Our Starship has four of these around the base and another four around the top. Up is toward the windows, down is toward the heat shields and left and right are relative to the ship. I don't know if SpaceX will keep the tradition of calling the right side starboard and the left side port, so we will use left and right. Let's start with what we call translation, moving without rotation. If we pulse all four sets of thrusters pointing in this direction, the ship will start to move in the opposite direction. We can then pulse with the same force to bring the ship to a stop. This looks easy, but even this simple maneuver is tricky. What if a thruster fails? If this top thruster fails, the others will fire and the ship will start to spin. Not just this way, which we call roll, but also this way, which we call yaw. This can be extremely dangerous, as Neil Armstrong and David Scott discovered during the Gemini 8 mission, when a short circuit in the electronics caused a thruster to malfunction, putting them into an uncontrolled spin and almost destroying the ship. If we have a good computer control system and all the thrusters work properly, we can move the ship up, down, left, right, forward, or backward. We can also swing the front of the ship sideways. This is called yaw. We can do the same to the back. We can roll the ship to the right or to the left, or pitch the ship down or up. We will have to pitch the starship up on re-entry to allow the heat shield to protect the ship, as air resistance against the broadside slows it down. So far, SpaceX has used cold gas nitrogen thrusters for these maneuvers. This is fine when your starship is not fully loaded with crew, cargo, and fuel, but will be completely inadequate to control a fully loaded and fueled starship that is about to leave orbit and go to Mars or the Moon. Can you imagine how much nitrogen gas you would need to shift that much mass? To increase efficiency, SpaceX plans to use hot gas thrusters. Hot gas thrusters imply combustion or thermoelectric heating. Apollo used hypergolic thrusters to control their spacecraft. Hypergolics work great. If you want to brush up on hypergolics, please review this lesson. Hypergolics are used on the SpaceX Dragon capsule. The Dragon capsule uses monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide to power the Draco thrusters. These two chemicals immediately combust on contact. These allow the Dragon capsule to gently dock with the ISS and position itself for re-entry. SpaceX even made a fun game you can play to try your hand at controlling the thrusters and coming into dock. It took a little practice before I didn't kill everyone on the Dragon and the ISS. But Starship needs to be able to fly on fuel produced on Mars. And hypergolics are toxic and not easy to make. I think SpaceX will use small methane and oxygen thrusters. They will place a specified amount of fuel and oxidizer in a combustion chamber, 
and quickly fire a spark igniter to cause them to burn and produce rust. This will have to be timed perfectly. The vacuum of space will quickly remove your propellant from the combustion chamber. One way to precisely control thruster power would be with a piston and a valve system. A specific amount of fuel and oxidizer would be placed in a cylinder. On command, the cylinder would compress these and then fire a spark igniter. When pressure is high enough, a valve would open, venting the expanding gas into the combustion chamber. This would allow precise control of the thrust produced. This would work very well for small or fine maneuvers, but the system to move the starship at full mass will need to be immensely powerful. Or they will need to fire at a precise thrust for a precise period of time. SpaceX could use small methylox thrusters with electric fuel and oxidizer pumps. Electric pumps don't need gas spin-up to function. Electric motors can provide very precise power to a pumping system. If you want to review electric power rocket engines, please review this lesson. Imagine a small 3D printed rocket engine, like the Rutherford produced by Rocket Lab, but modified for methane fuel instead of RP-1. These engines can produce the same acceleration by pulsing very accurately one or more times, or by firing continuously for a perfectly accurate amount of time. The computer system will have sensors to feed back the thrust and subsequent acceleration produced, and could adjust the power or time of burn on the other thrusters to compensate. There will need to be high power thrust adjustments for Starship at high mass, and much smaller thrust adjustments for Starships at lower mass. Small corrections must be made frequently to keep a ship on course in space. Just one person walking from one part of the ship to another imparts a momentum over the ship. Over time, this must be canceled out by reaction wheels or propellant thrusters. The Starship will have an advanced reaction control system, capable of precisely maneuvering the ship and providing orientation control long before the first crewed flight. But for the upcoming orbital test flight, there will be no payload, removing up to 100 tons of mass, and they will load just enough fuel for a parabolic flight. The ship will go into space, but it will not achieve orbital velocity. The cold gas nitrogen thrusters you see being tested here will be perfectly fine to keep a low mass starship on course as it travels partway around the Earth and comes down for a water landing. Something much more powerful will be needed for a fully fueled and loaded starship as it leaves Earth orbit on its way to the moon. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget that we have Academy themed gear available in the Academy store. There are links in the description. We appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.